So I guess we'll, we'll do one more and then wrap it up. Do you want to do one from the study guide? It's all in there. It, it's the first thing in the, the sapling. Um, So I like this one because it has, um, it's not your just average sort of question, but I need to draw out the, the answers first. So it, here's the question, and I'll write down the clues, basically, and then what, what is the prompt. It says an optically active alcohol with a molecular formula of C5H8O undergoes hydrogenation over platinum to give an optically inactive alcohol. Which of these alcohols is consistent with this data? So here's the data. It has the molecular formula C5H8O. It is optically active. It's then hydrogenated with hydrogen gas, platinum metal, to give an alcohol that is optically inactive. So which of the compounds shown is consistent with the data? So this is the last. So the, the first thing I want to sort of walk you through this, because sometimes when you are given a problem that has a lot of reading to it, sometimes they're not as complicated as you might think. So C5H8O, just looking at that, can you eliminate one of these choices immediately? So you can eliminate D because there's three carbons. So don't fall for like cheap things like that. So if you look at the rest of them, I believe they're all five carbons, so you really can't use that trick anymore. The next thing I want you to do, C5H8O, how many degrees of unsaturation are in that? So there's two. So oxygen doesn't count. So for C5, fully saturated is C5H12. So you would get two degrees of unsaturation out of that. And then if you look 
A, B, and C are all two degrees of unsaturation. So you can't eliminate anything based on that. Now the next thing it says, C5H8O is optically active. Based on that piece of data, can you eliminate A, B, or C? What does it mean to be optically active? I guess that it's showing. What? It's, well, I guess this is wrong, but what I would think is that you could, you could actually see it. You could see that there's <laughs> A and C. So you're, you're talking about the number of hydrogens? answer that point, your point first. I think they all have eight hydrogens, so I don't think you can eliminate them off that. They all have one hydrogen, so remember optical activity means there is at least one carbon that is a stereogenic carbon. What does a stereogenic carbon mean? It's got four different things attached. It's got four different things attached. So knowing that, now look at A, B, and C. Why? Because there's no tire acid. Yeah, this, this compound has a mirror plane. I've drawn that pretty crappily, so maybe that was distracting you. But if you start here and you walk there, you see these CH2s and you see these CH. So you can eliminate that. It's not optically active. Well, it, it's saying, so what we're looking at now, these are the starting materials. The starting material has to be optically active. So what do you need to do now? Are there ants? No, I don't want to raise my hand. I'll find them. Okay. Okay. It's, it's, it's floor colored. You can't see it anymore. So what do you need to do now? Take. A and B, hydrogenate them both, and then compare the products. So what does that mean? If we take A, that is what A looks like in that form. That is what B looks like. So the asterisk is the chirality center, stereogenic carbon. If you take this and hydrogenate it, it has two degrees of unsaturation. They're going away. Do the same thing for here. Now based on that, it says that an alcohol is produced that is optically inactive. So what's the correct choice? So pay attention to that, inactive. A. You see the symmetry in A? So B still has a stereogenic carbon. So the correct answer for this one is going to be A. So what I want you to do is not be like disheartened or anything if you if you can't follow all that, but take 
take solace in knowing that you've learned a lot of chemistry this semester and you can you can logically start removing distractor answers to set yourself up better um, to arrive at the right answer. So I mean there's a lot of information in here, right? I mean knowing what a triple bond is, what the orbitals of that are, knowing that's an alcohol, knowing what optical activity is in terms of stereogenic carbon, knowing the instrument that's used to measure optical activity, knowing what Call this a meso compound. You know what a meso compound is. Just using some simple logic to throw, get rid of the throwaway answers. Really, it's um, you've, you've trained yourself, so you have another training session on Wednesday, and you have the big Super Bowl next Thursday. <laughs> so. Like, I don't know, my advice is to just, like, don't stress, because stress makes you forget things. <laughs> so if you predict the product. So even though this was from today's lecture, do you recognize what those conditions do? Yeah, I wish I had um, a statement, like a theory of everything that I could tell you that would <laughs> sort of squash those stressors or whatever, but I don't know, it, it's, it just comes with time. You know, obviously there's not much time left, but... Um, so like everything would be in it? It's not in it completely. So. Next semester in 256, like the first third of that semester deals with oxidation and reduction. And so what you have to get good at is, is when you look at a reagent, is it an oxidizer or is it a reducer? Knowing, knowing that, if this is solvent, looking at this reagent, what do you think it's gonna do? Oxidize. It's gonna oxidize because there's or there's three oxygens. So that's what its job is, is to deliver oxygens. How do you know if something's a reducing agent? There's a lot of hydrogen present. So you're gonna, you're gonna use reagents that have um, either hydrogen itself or hydride, which is the negative. So when you see, um, I, I wouldn't really call like acids like HCl like reducing agents because typically when you react them with organic molecules they're not technically doing a reduction. But in this case the O3 which is ozone is, is doing an oxidation. And so these conditions are called oxidative cleavage. So if I ask you some questions to try to walk you through what's happening, if I tell you that carbons one and two are going to be cleaved, that's the cleave part, they're both sp2 hybridized, they're going to remain sp2 hybridized. 
each of them is going to get an oxygen and form a carbonyl. So what functional group will carbon 1 end up as? A ketone. What functional group will carbon 2 end up as? going to be an aldehyde. It can't be an alcohol because to do that the hybridization would have to change to sp3. It's going to remain as sp2. So what I want you to sort of in lieu of completely understanding the mechanism for this is Identify the alkene, and what you're going to do is basically sort of cleave it like that. You're pulling it apart, then where that former double bond was, each carbon gets an oxygen. So that's a ketone. So I don't want to jam these carbonyls back together. I'm going to draw this a little funky. And that's an aldehyde. You both rang. I didn't see that coming. There's some sort of like either dance troupe or zombie invasion going on in the garage top level right now. What are you more afraid of, like fast-moving zombies or slow-moving zombies? The fast ones? Yeah. Like the World War Z zombies? Yeah. <laughs> I think if a zombie apocalypse like broke out and they were fast-moving zombies, I'd be like, I give up. You know, just, just end it right away, you know what I mean? Rather than like live in misery in like a desolate world. So when you said cleave, I thought you were breaking apart the double bond, but you broke apart the ring. So let me let me put up another example well, that, that's not a ring. So pretty much the same conditions. So you're doing the same thing here. Really, whatever is attached to those alkenes just, just comes along. They don't really get affected. So carbon 1, when you cleave it, is going to end up as what? So that'll be an aldehyde. Carbon 2 will be what? So what you're looking for is there are the two alkene carbons. You're then basically splitting them in half, like pulling them apart. You're replacing the double bond with an oxygen, so you get carbonyl. So the fact that this has an H and a C means that's going to be an aldehyde. This has C and C means it's a ketone. Can you draw out what it looks like after once it cleans? The products or? Example, does it completely break off part of the molecule? 
Yeah, you get two separate molecules. So let, let me ask you a question. Can you draw the Lewis dot structure of ozone, O3? So oxygen has six electrons. Yeah, there would be a double bond in there. Nope. So you need to you need to do something else to account for. Is it gonna be a ring? No. So you have three oxygens. You have to account for eighteen electrons. What? So, yeah, you can't just have like a negative oxygen. There has to be a positive one balancing it out. So what, what, is, what is ozone? So organic chemists call it a 1,3 dipole. So formally what this is, um, is a dipole or cyclo addition. It's probably sort of beyond what you need to know. But I think you should reasonably be able to, if you're given ozone structure, to draw the, the addition step. So we'll do that now. but. If the pi bond is acting as a nucleophile, it can attack that ozone. And so you know that each carbon has to get an oxygen. So we can sort of draw something reasonable to begin with. Then it gets hellaciously complicated, and I don't teach it in class because students, because I mean, it, it's pretty long, and a weird rearrangement happens, and I'm like, forget about it. It, it, it gets it to be a bit much. So let's just say this is any alkene. I'm not going to put substituents on. I'm just going to show you like the first step. So if this negative charge attacks the pi bond, the pi bond then breaks. It's going to attack this terminal oxygen. And then that pi bond will put the electrons on the middle oxygen, and then you end up with a neutral species. So this is like the first step of many. And again, I don't think at this point you really need to know the whole thing if you understand the concept of, of the, the cleavage part. So at that point, each carbon gets an oxygen. Now, you know, like, in terms of mechanisms, where we're like one step along the way, what has to happen? This has to cleave. This has to get a pi bond. That has to get a pi bond. Then, as the British say, the sticky wicket here is that. Where does that go? So, it gets complicated because this thing breaks apart and then it recombines. And so I, I admit I don't like teaching that because students are, why does it do that? And I'm like, why does anything do anything? I don't know. <laughs> um, so really the, the main thing is identify the alkene, chop it in half, add some oxygens. 
But that's the first step. So you're asking me, am I going to like just harvest the same questions and recycle them? <laughs> um, I've done that in the past. Um, since if you were taking the final Monday, I would 100% do that. But since I have three juicy full work days, I'm probably going to make a new final exam. Um, just because I think what I've noticed, like in your guys' class specifically, People are doing very well on the exams, and by all means, but I need to um, sort of moderate the, the performance a bit. So <laughs> I'm going to come up with new questions, because I, I think the ones have been circulating a while, and, and people know what to expect. So <laughs> that's probably disappointing to a lot of people. <laughs> Reaction itself, or what, like the mechanism? Just like the process. So, okay, so there are like other specific reagents in your book that will do this, but the way I showed it was like a two step process. So, I'll just pick a substrate and we'll, we'll go through it again, um, just so you, that you can see after you do a one, two addition, like what you can do afterwards. So So maybe we'll just go through stepwise and then predict the product that way. So I've labeled the alkene carbons one and two. So with bromine and water, these conditions form what is known as a halo hydrin. Hydrin, I guess, is just a fancy word for an alcohol. But I guess the, the relevance of it means that it's a one-two relationship. So the bromine is going to be the electrophile. So it's going to add to that one-two bond and form a bromonium ion. So now at, at this point, um, you, 
you have a choice where that water is going to attack. And so what you can sort of do is if the plus charge didn't reside on bromine, it would reside on one of those carbons. So if you opened up this, if you opened up the ring this way, the plus charge would be here. And if you opened up the other way, it would be there. So if it was there, it would be what? What classification of carbocation? Tertiary, and that would be would be primary. So there's only one carbon bonded to it. So this bond is actually weaker, which means the water will attack there. They are. Yeah, they are. So anytime you, you form one of these protonated alcohols, you should really use water to deprotonate it. So your, your product after the first step there of conditions. is a bromohydrine. So what you're doing in the second step is treating with sodium hydride, which is a base. And of this molecule, you have one, two, three, four unique sets of hydrogen. When you treat with a base, this is the most acidic one, so that's the one that gets deprotonated. So I put in some delta minus, delta plus across that CBr bond. So a negatively charged oxygen is a nuclear vial. A carbon bearing a bromine is an electrophile. That's a good medium group. So if you count one, two, three, that will attack there, that will attack. So it, you can think of it like an SN2 reaction. So the 2 in SN2 stands for bimolecular. But this is not bimolecular because the nucleophile and electrophile are in the same molecule. So it's called intramolecular. So this clamps down. That then leaves. you form this compound, which is an epoxide. So just as an aside, not that you care, but if you notice that this carbon, that carbon has four substituents. So it's called a quaternary carbon. There's no hydrogens. And it doesn't look like it the way I've drawn it, but it's called a spirocenter. So the rings are actually orthogonal to one another. And making those type of ring junctions is really hard. So it's, it's sort of interesting to study how to make those things. That's sort of one of the things I do in my lab. So. That just gives you an idea of where you're headed in 256. How many people are taking 256 next semester?
Yeah, I believe it's Tuesday, Thursdays from like 1.15 to 2.45. It's a marathon. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask a... Can I borrow your computer to write the problem down? So this is alkyne synthesis. So I can I, I know there's going to be grumbling because I didn't necessarily talk about this stuff because we ran out of time. So if you see a question or two or five, just kidding, on the exam, don't be pissed off. Um, read the sheet that I gave you. It's pretty much all you need to know about all kinds. So this uh, sapling problem, they're giving you this compound, which I guess I'll, I'll walk you through the naming and whatnot. Yes, ma'am. I'm from the north, so when I say yes, ma'am, I'm being sort of facetious. <laughs> they don't normally, they don't normally say it. So, firstly. Can you tell me the name of the alkyne that I drew up there? Not quite. Nope. Got to go the other way. How many carbons do you have? Propine. So alkynes end in Y-N-E. So remember when we talked about alkenes, there's a whole bunch of different kinds. You know, tetra, tri, di, which could be cis or trans or, or geminal, then mono. So alkynes are, there are two kinds of alkynes. <laughs> so the one that's shown here is called terminal because yeah, exactly. It's on the end, and, and it has that hydrogen. That hydrogen's important. You have to have that to have a terminal alkyne. An internal alkyne is flanked by carbon and carbon. So maybe we'll, we'll do that other one, just so people can see what, what the other part of this question is. So I can see why you put the answer you put. So it's, it's, it goes back to SN2 chemistry, so you kind of fell for the trap. So we'll, we'll go through the first step and then the second step. So when you have a terminal alkyne, that alkyne proton is acidic. So the pKa is about 25. You have a strong base. This is called sodium amide. So the first thing that happens is an acid-base reaction. So you lose ammonia. And you generate this thing, which is a carbanion. So again, we didn't get to talk a whole lot about carb carbanions, but we will 256. 
A carbanion is a nucleophile. Or it can be a base. What you drew in your answer was acting as a nucleophile because you formed a carbon-carbon bond. The second thing they're treating with is, is shown here. I'm going to underline it in blue. That's an alkyl bromide, right? When you look at that, what's the classification of this alkyl bromide? It, it's tertiary. That right there precludes substitution. So remember, in any reaction, there's a nucleophile electrophile. The electrophile is tertiary, so it cannot do substitution. If it can't do substitution, it has to do elimination. So this is where you, you really have to draw out what that is. So that thing I underlined in blue, if you draw it out, there's your central carbon bromine. Then you have three methyl groups on that. So that's tertiary halide. So what is it going to do? It's going to do an elimination. So you have an alpha carbon, three beta carbons. Don't matter which one. I'm only going to show one of the hydrogens. That's going to abstract that and then eliminate. So what, what essentially are you doing? You're forming your starting material back. plus um, two methylpropene and sodium bromide. So this one was probably thrown in there to trick you if you like to blame like that. You tricked me. Shame on you. So what if what if you use those first two conditions, but the electrophile you used was, what's the name of the electrophile they use? How many carbons are in the chain? Ethyl bromide? OK. So instead of using um, this 2,2-dimethyl or sorry, 2-bromo-2-methylpropane, they're using ethyl bromide. So knowing what you know now, what I just explained to you, tell me the name of the product so I can draw it on the board. Pentine. So this abstracts that. You generate a carbanion. That nucleophile attacks there. This whole thing stays in place. One, two, three, four, five. So you're going from a, a terminal to an internal alkyne. So how many unique carbons does this one have? What? I was using the numbers to name it. It's five. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> sometimes questions aren't that challenging, I guess. So it's five. 
what you don't want to get confused about is, so there's, there's a carbon here and a carbon here. They are different. So this has a methyl and that has like a CH2 and then a methyl. So yeah, you'll typically, you will not see textbooks, maybe I'll use blue, textbooks won't draw those carbons in like that. The, the letter C is not there. So carbocation rearrangement. So we're asked to draw the mechanism. So what I'm going to do now is put in um, just some numbers so that you can sort of see the carbon backbone. And then you can describe like what's changing. So I'm going to call this one, two, three, four. And presumably if, if no rotations or things like that were done, I could just give it the same numbering. One, two, three, four. So maybe I'll, I'll just ask some questions to walk you through how I'm thinking about this. What is changing from carbons, from carbon one in the starting material to carbon one in the product? What? Yeah, so there's a pi bond between one and two. You so two hydrogens and one, and in the product you got three. So C1. So maybe I'll, I'll put SM for starting material. I'm going to put product. No pi bond. So what is, what is that telling you right away? C1 is, is getting a proton. Where is it coming from? It's coming from the acid that you're treating it with. So what about C2? probably haven't been the most clear about that throughout the semester. I wouldn't think of it in that regard. Because the way you the way you classify other things is typically that's usually reserved for sp3 hybridized atoms. So when you get into sp2 it, it doesn't mean the same thing. So what's what's on carbon 2 in the starting material? And how does it change going to the product? C2 in the starting material has one hydrogen. And the other one with the product, it's, it's two double hydrogen. But now it's also got a so C2 starts with one hydrogen, ends with one hydrogen, and it gains a methyl group. What about C3? What's in the starting material?
So C3 has two methyl groups in the starting material. Then in um, the product, it only has one methyl group, and it's replaced with chlorine. So that list that we just did is sort of writing down the arrows that we now have to draw. And the thing with mechanisms, you know where you're starting, you know where you have to go. It's, it's finding like the path to get there. So each thing you do gets you a little bit closer, but never lose track of like those things you just identified, which is another way of saying don't start making stuff up <laughs> because you're you're like fall off the edge of the earth. So carbon one has two hydrogens, it's getting a third. So we know how to do that by protonating. And that's what the acid is going to do. So I'll just draw these in just to show you. So what classification of carbocation is was just was drawn there? So it's a secondary carbocation. And again, anytime you form a carbocation, you keep this in mind. That's the stability trend. Since you form a secondary, you have to look, can I form something more stable, which would be a tertiary. And so to do that, what I'm going to do in blue, I'm going to call the, the blue carbon bearing the plus charge the alpha carbon. You have to go out to the beta carbons, which are next door. So beta, beta. Since you already did something at that carbon one position, you wouldn't do any, oh, maybe I'll just call this beta prime. You won't do anything at beta prime because you've, you've just protonated that anyway. So if you look at the other beta position, it's bearing three methyl groups. So what can happen is one of those will shift over it's a 1-2 methyl shift. So you're always conserving charge. So that plus charge, we, we know that at this point, carbon 2 gets a methyl group and carbon 3 loses one. So we can shift over a methyl group. So what I want to be clear of that, these two electrons move over to form a bond, and that methyl group comes along. So this, as a consequence of that, that plus charge has to move over here because now it's going to be electron deficient. So when that happens, this is a, a one-way arrow that's downhill. So now you have this tertiary plus charge, and we know that's more stable. And you know from what we've written already that carbon-3 is getting a chlorine, and we have the chloride anion that can come and trap it. So maybe as a quick review, how many unique carbons should this structure have? What'd you say? Does everyone agree? So we have one, that's the same, two, three, and four. So maybe I'll ask a slightly more difficult question. I'll lead up to a slightly more difficult question. What is the molecular formula of this compound?
Well, that's that's the name. I want the the formula. So the count of each each type of element. So the hydrogen count is going to be odd because you have that halogen. So C6H13Cl. So you can, you can tell by visual inspection there's no degrees of unsaturation there. So let's do a, a smidge of math. I don't think anything we need a calculator for, but let's see. So now that we have the molecular formula, what's the molecular weight? If just use Carbon's 12, hydrogen's 1, and chlorine's 35. Said it was 35? Yeah. One, two, Sounds about right. Let's just go with that. So why do I bring this up? So other than NMR, so carbon NMR, another instrumental method you can use to determine, let me sort of backtrack. Carbon NMR, the molecular formula has six carbons. There's only four unique carbons. So there's some sort of symmetry which you can see, right? What carbon NMR will not tell you is what this other thing is. You know there's no degrees of unsaturation, but there's some other element. And so the, the way you find out what this is is through mass spec. And so the way that mass spec is useful for halogens, for chlorine in particular, this would be I'll sort of show a revised molecular formula. This weight is for chlorine 35. But there's two naturally occurring isotopes of chlorine, so 35 and 37. So what we can do is put a 35 here. So when you run this reaction, you'll actually get two products out. And the ratio of those two in mass spec, the parent ion, so remember in mass spec, you have M to Z with increasing charge this way. Here you have percent abundance. At 115 and um, 117, basically, you would see, so that peak and then another peak that's one-third the size. So we would call this the parent M, and this would be M plus two. So that's a way of determining what halogen was used. So for example, if I gave you, say I gave you this exact thing, but instead I didn't tell you that that was chlorine. I just put X. Then I gave you some data that looked like this. And I said, A is fluorine, B is chlorine, C is bromine, D is iodine. So you'd have to look at, okay, it's, yet, it's adding HX, but then you look at this data to determine which of those halogens was used. Because this is like a fingerprint. The chlorine gives a three to one ratio. Bromine gives one to one, which means these peak heights are equal. Fluorine doesn't really do anything. And then iodine, wherever your M peak is, you'll have an M minus 127 peak. That's pretty prominent. Because if you look on there, 53, Group 17 is, is iodine, which is 126.9.
So we didn't get to do a lot of those type of problems this semester, but that's what mass spec is useful for. So you're just supposed to know that if it's three to one, it's chlorine. Yes. And if it's one to one, it's bromine. bromine. So it, its atomic mass is 19. I think it, it definitely does not have another isotope like chlorine and bromine do, where you would see where they're in like that abundance. Um, the iodine doesn't really either, uh, naturally. It's Speaking, I mean, so the carbon iodide bonds cleave pretty easy. That's why you see the minus 127. But chlorine being 19, I don't think when you add it in there, it makes the mass seem any more unusual than anything else. Um, there's a lot of like little tricks you can do with these masses. Like if things are odd, that sort of gives you an indication that there's probably a nitrogen or some weird combination of some two other elements or something. Um, maybe I'll open up the floor if you guys have questions. Do you want to do another one from the, the book? Go backwards. Let's do... So we're going to do addition of HCl to an alkene. There's our alkene. There's our HCl. the alkene with some numbers to help us track. Do you ever see Indiana Jones when he asks him to, to choose the, the chalice that Jesus drank from? And there's a room full of chalices. And, and the knight says, you must choose, but choose wisely. So this is where we're at. We must choose, but wisely. So you know that either carbon 1 or carbon 2 is going to get the proton. And the choice that you have to make is what you're looking to do is form the most stable carbocation. That's, that's the name of the game. So you really only have two things to consider. So my advice is just to draw out both pathways so that you can see how they split, then make your decision. So let's, let's sort of show that. So the upper pathway, um, let's say we're going to protonate carbon 2. The lower one, we protonate carbon 1. So again, mechanistically to show that. So if 2 gets the proton, then 1 gets the carbocation. Then the other route, if one gets the proton, then two is the carbocation. And I'm strictly using just one and two as numbers to identify them. That doesn't mean anything in particular. So the top one is what classification of carbocation? 
That's tertiary, and the bottom one is what? That's primary. So the tertiary is more stable than secondary, which is more stable than primary. So even if you did go through route one, it would it would rearrange through a, a one. So this is a a one two hydride shift to give you that tertiary carbocation. And then what happens at this point is you get trapping by the chloride ion. So maybe if I can, if you'll allow me to refresh your brains from module three. So if you look at that compound, it's, it's a tertiary alkyl chloride. If you remember from radical substitution, you're, you're most likely not ever going to form a tertiary radical under, under chlorination conditions. Because chlorine's so reactive, you're gonna get a distribution. So really what this is, is it's a way to make that compound drawn selectively. So if you took this compound just the strictly um, alkene, and you try to do radical chlorination, you really wouldn't isolate that product that's drawn in, in any sort of high yield. Because statistically you have, you have CH3 here, you only have one tertiary H. You have these methylenes which are equivalent, these methylenes which are equivalent, and then that final one. So you could never really isolate that in, in a high yield. So again, sort of where all this is going over the next couple days since you're in this class, we don't have more time to discuss like making more complex things, but the reason so many reactions exist is, you know, not, not every reaction you run with molecular chlorine is gonna give you the thing you want. Yes. I can throw a couple more chapters in there if you'd like. No. Let's let's do one where a, a rearrangement actually occurs. It's determining major product when you've got options. Okay, which one's the major one? Okay. So this is the hydration of an alkene. <clears throat> so again, in module four, we're dealing with unsaturation. So the synthesis of alkenes and alkynes, uh, and, and then their reactions. So um, the, the things you want to know are obviously identifying an alkene, and then being able to look at uh, the conditions so in this case, we have water in, in H plus and diagnose what that's doing. So verbally, it's, it's a hydration. 
And so what I'm going to do in, in red here is just mark this is carbon 1 and carbon 2 of that alkene. I'm going to go ahead and draw in the hydrogen that they didn't show. Um, and so in any addition, both sp2 hybridized carbons of the alkene um, get something added to them, and the hybridization changes it to sp3. So um, we have this cyclopentene, and you basically at this point have a choice of where that proton is going to add to carbon 1 or carbon 2. So what do you think it's, it's going to do, preferably? What? The proton will add to carbon 1? I think it'll add to 2. So we've got a street fight. We're going to duke it out. So I'm going to sort of present this in a different way than I have in class. I'll put up both in terms of like a reaction coordinate. Hint, hint so that you sort of know why one is formed over the other. And so the way I want to do this, I'm going to use up quite a bit of space here. Whoops. So we're, we're starting here at some energy. If we add that proton to carbon one, carbon two then becomes a carbocation, right? Does everyone follow that? So let's go ahead and we'll show that with an, uh, sort of going uphill. So what that is going to form at this point is that carbocation, which is what classification? So which is it? Where are we looking at? We're looking at the carbocation right here. Cool. Oh, okay. Thank you. I was confused by it. So this is a secondary carbocation. If we add the proton to carbon 2, what sort of carbocation are we going to generate? Tertiary. So what does this mean? So you're starting at the same point down here because it's the same starting material, but you're not going to go up as steep a hill. So that's going to form. So we've added that H there. We form that carbocation, which is tertiary. And you see at this point how it's lower in energy? than the secondary. So it doesn't have to walk up as steep a hill. So of the two choices, it's going to prefer the, the tertiary. So it gets there, um, and then basically at this point, the, the addition of the water is going to take place. So since these are actually intermediates, um, they would sort of, the carbocation would reside like in a well. Um, is, is a better representation of that. So what happens next is that you have the water, which is solvent, and it's uh, participating, then traps. So this one is the one that moves on. And so that's not the final product because it's not yet neutral. Then you do a proton transfer with the water, which regenerates the acid catalyst. And what you end up with is that, which is a tertiary alcohol. So that would be answer So from the study guide, this is answer B. So typically, now that I've taught this class a couple times, I, I use the study guide every semester. 
one of the things like with this class, not life in general, but this class in that study guide, two of the answers are just really just bad distractors. And you can get rid of them because they've done something that's sort of illogical. Um, and that leaves you with two, which there's, that's when the stuff that you really have to be, pick out, what is the difference? So in this one, these would be the two reasonable ones, A and B, because this is just trapping the other carbon. <coughs> this one and this one are, are the distractors, because they're basically saying like one of these methyl groups is, is somehow cleaving that bond to move over, which you, you cannot do. Then this one, this carbon is already it's saturated to begin with. Not learned anything to do that. So I guess that's just sort of keeping some logic in mind. What's confusing me about it is I guess when you were saying if it's tertiary or secondary, you were looking at what it's not added to, I guess in a way. Correct. Yeah, so this is, um, in your book, they call it Markovnikov's rule. And that's pretty much the general thing is that SP2 hybridized carbon with the most hydrogens gets the electrophile. So the consequence of that is you're forming the more stable carbocation. So in terms of like no way with our nitrogen storage center, it, this isn't a problem, right? It is. Let me pick one out of this book. We'll go through it, and I'll show you that it is the same. So that was hydration of an alkene. I can move forward here. 